watch the, the entire time. So I'll, I'll do, hopefully this will be more of a you know, conversation in the end. I'll try to keep the, the presentation somewhat short to give you an overview of kind of what we're doing and the scope of the work as it's expanded beyond pocket guides and the app. And a little bit of my specific role doing monitoring and evaluation. My formal title is business intelligence manager, which is data. That sounds important. That sounds it's, really important. Most people probably don't <laughs> know what business intelligence is yet. It's, it's taking mostly large data sets and turning it into like interactive dashboards and information that leadership can use to make adaptive management decisions. Like are our strategies actually having the effect on the world that we're intending them to? And if not, we should shift our resources to more effective approaches. Mm. So we're trying to kind of use um, the information we have at our fingertips and have had for a while to actually understand like where should our next report, like if we're gonna write something um, new, have a new rating or a new, a new like farm assessed, um, where should that be? What are the highest priority unrated um, production areas that are you know, of concern for us? So I'll, I'll jump into a first, a little quick intro into like what Seafood Watch actually is and where, when we started. So um, we started in about 1999, which is two years after the aquarium itself started sourcing only sustainable seafood for its on-site dining and animal feed operations. Um, so uh, what happened is we had a, a temporary exhibit called uh, Fishing for Solutions, mm -hmm. where we talked about the differing impacts of different fishing practices and the environmental sustainability of the, the, you know, the products that those fisheries um, catch. And so we had these little tents, these little uh, table tents, little cards that we would put so that the diners could know you're eating this kind of cod from this area of the world and this is how sustainable we, we suspect it is. Um, but it was a very kind of high level analysis. We weren't getting that deep and doing um, real research. It was, it was um, a more light touch approach at that point. But uh, some aquarium staff noticed that a lot of those table cards were getting taken by the diners at the end of their meal and brought home so they would have the information in their pocket as to what they were eating and so they could, you know, we assumed buy it again or have that information easily accessible. So that's what started the pocket guide idea. They, they said, well, we could do this a little in a little more systematic way for a lot more products on the US market like shrimp and salmon and tuna and things that are very popular and just consolidate it down to a really simple guide that people could carry with them when they're shopping and mm -hmm. and and the, the vision was that the, the market pressure that that would generate would cause retailers and restaurants to start thinking about sustainable seafood because enough people are asking for it mm -hmm. um, and that would just kind of push its way up the supply chain and eventually get to producers and, and they would feel the market pressure coming from the US or, or markets that we influence um, so that they could improve their production practices and, and get better access to some of the um, businesses and consumers that we've worked with. Um, so like all of this is basically founded on our, our science-based, really in-depth peer-reviewed um, assessments, our reports that are effectively you know, 50 to 100 page white papers that we have a fleet of analysts write for us. None of the staff actually do the work, um, but they, um, they uh, you know, basically consolidate all of the relevant, most up-to-date information and compare uh, the information they're gathering to our standards, which are quantitative and scored, and they um, basically produce the, the best choice good alternative and avoid rating at the end of that assessment process. They just, there's um, um, a platform that we use online that helps write and generate the PDFs and it scores everything automatically, so there's no interpretation really. The interpretation is built into the standard itself and the analysts are just plugging in variables that are relevant and the calculations are done in the back end. So, you know, best choice is, is our kind of buy uh, name. So we want people to, um, you know, prefer to buy best choice options if they can find them in, in the stores. And a good alternative is, you know, better than red, but there's still some concerns about the environmental performance of those operations. So um, that should be your second choice. And then avoid is basically don't buy. There's serious concerns with bycatch or habitat impacts or poor management. Um, and we, we don't want to support those fisheries. So it is basically an economic model. We're trying to apply market pressure to influence environmental performance of these, of these fisheries and farms. Um, so you might have seen in the news recently, we downgraded the American lobster fisheries on the east coast of the U.S. And that got a lot of uh, blowback for us and governors calling Julie Packard and um, lots of angry emails and news articles and things um, because they were you know, upset about the environmental or sorry, the economic impact of that rating. And we, we're not, we're not in the mark, we're not in the business of trying to take, right. you know, in, income from people, but um, there is, that is kind of the model we're, we're building on is, is like, if, if you aren't, um, if you're in this case, if they're, if they're causing the decline of uh, critically endangered North Atlantic right whales, 
there has to be a, an issue, like a penalty for that. And if we can't in good conscience rate them as yellow or green and encourage people to buy those when there's 60 whales in the wild left and if we don't do something quick, you know, they're not gonna be around in a decade. So, so we have to kind of deal with that. Red ratings get us a lot of heat sometimes. Other times nobody seems to care because <laughs> their consumers don't care. They haven't even heard right. of us. So right. there's, there's, you know, um, kind of a very widespread of results that we were getting from these things. And we're trying to kind of hone that in and, and do reports and ratings on, on really important products where we actually have influence and our business partners have influence. Otherwise it's a moot report that kind of nobody, nobody actually reads or listens to. Um, so the, the Seafood Watch program is broken into three kind of departments, although we don't call them that, they're teams. So we have the, the science program, which are, is the group of internal reviewers that are conducting and reviewing our scientific assessments. Um, and it's the, tr the trained staff that are hired by Seafood Watch that manage a subset of those analysts that are doing the actual report writing for us. And then the reviewers get those reports and make sure that they're being scored properly according to our standards and they're at, you know, giving them comments and feedback before it goes through our peer review process. Um, and here's basically the, the outline of what we're looking at in our wild fishery standard. Uh, criterion one is just impacts on the stock being assessed. Um, how healthy is it? Is it being overfished or undergoing overfishing? Um, things like that. Criterion two is impacts to other species. Are they accidentally catching turtles, dolphins, or, or things like that? And there's obviously demerits applied if they are. Uh, criterion three is management effectiveness. Um, that's usually um, you know at the country or state level, depending on what you're evaluating. Um, and then habitat and ecosystem impacts, and that's relating to the gear type that's being used. Certain like pole and line fisheries are only catching this targeted species for the most part. Other things like purse sings or bottom trawl are catching huge volumes of bycatch that aren't as marketable. So in some, say, shrimp fisheries, um, they will have 10 pounds of unwanted bycatch every one pound of valuable shrimp they catch, and they're tossing that stuff overboard, usually not alive anymore. Um, so we don't want that. You know to happen so we'll um you know mark them down um in those categories if that's if that's the case but that's how our wild fishery standard is uh structured if you're more curious the whole you know 60 page document is available with all the calculations and scoring rubrics in there but this, this is just the highlights and then the aquaculture standard is a little bit uh more complicated because it's uh you know, there's actually, there's like infrastructure built around these operations and stuff. So we, we look at things like data quality and availability, because most of the data we're getting, these are private operations. So we have to get the information about how much antibiotic use they're applying, uh, what type of feed they're using. All of that comes from the, the company that's um, producing these for the most part, or, or the country that's, that's monitoring those companies. Um, so if it's sparse and we really can't evaluate it that effectively because the data is lacking then we have to score them appropriately for that then there's effluent just the the release of the of the waters from the farm into surrounding water bodies and how that's treated or not habitat impacts is the farm siting is it is it in historic mangrove habitat that they've cleared to to build the farms in which case uh, that's obviously not ideal criterion four is chemical use antibiotics and antimicrobials in general um, how often are they used? Are those antibiotics critical for human health as well? Um, in which case there's all these different uh, scoring, uh, uh, like breakpoints that would uh, cause them to be score, uh, you know, uh, rated low for that um, uh, chemical use. And then the type of feed that they're using, they have a thing, uh, the acronym is FIFO, fish in, fish out ratio, which is how much, how many pounds of fish meal are included or fish oil are in the feed for every pound of fish you produce. If you're feeding these animals more fish volume than you're getting from the production, um, that isn't very efficient. Uh, criterion six is escapes. You've probably heard of the concerns of like BC salmon or any farm salmon getting out of their, their net pens and um, either interbreeding with the wild population or passing diseases off to the wild population. Um, so we have a, a criterion to account for that. Disease is kind of what I mentioned. If, the, if there's disease outbreaks and they're traced back reliably to the farm operation, um, that's, that's not a good thing and we'll score them low for that. Source of stock uh, is where do they get um, the, the animals that they end up growing in the uh, farm operation. So in some cases it's wild stock that they're bringing into a farm situation to, to beef it up, to fatten it up and to make a uh, you know, market ready product. Um, other times it's um, you know, stocks that they get from um, 
uh, you know, the farm operation itself or from other farms from sources that are just producing those. Um, so they get scored differently in, in, on that category. And then wildlife mortalities, 9X is, uh, the X identifies, by the way, an exceptional criterion, meaning that's a, you could, the expectation is that there's the source of stock is uh, from a non-wild source, that there's no wildlife mortalities and there's no introductions of foreign pathogens in any of these operations. Um, if, if they do that, they get, a, they get only negative numbers. There's no plus points for any of this stuff because a, a zero would be, would be you're doing the right thing. So wildlife mortalities, in some cases, there are farms that will accidentally or deliberately kill uh, seabirds or uh, sea lions and things that are predating on the, uh, on the fish they're farming, which we, we uh, would score them low for. And then in introductions of foreign pathogens and things in the, in the natural water bodies would be uh, something to be concerned about. So we have a criterion for that as well. Um, any questions on the standards or anything like that so far? So it's the same standard for, for uh, in, in ocean versus on terrestrial uh, production then? Yeah, yeah, exactly. The aquaculture is, is yeah, be used um, in both instances. Yeah. Okay, here's a, a summary of our ratings at the moment. We have 247 published reports that we're maintaining and updating every three to five years. They include, I think this number is a bit higher now, like 1670 is the number of ratings that we have for individual species from a specific part of the world using a specific gear type. Uh, that's 276 species that have ratings in 53 countries. And that covers about 41% of global production. Um, we have another 8% of global production in progress in a Peruvian and Chilean anchoveta report and a farmed carp from China report. Mm. Those are huge production fisheries or, and, and farming operations. Um, so that'll get us right up about 50% of the planet is, is rated by Seafood Watch and we're trying to chip away at that. Um, one of the challenges is we're a US-based um, NGO and we have a lot of relationships uh, with the fisheries here and an expectation that we'll maintain those U.S. ratings. But a lot of the U.S. ratings are very, very small volume and globally not that significant. But if we were to drop a U.S. rating, we're going to have to deal with the angry fishermen that like that green rating and don't want it to go away, even if for us strategically, it's not improving the world much. It's just recognizing high performance. So we're trying to figure out how do we get to like 75% global coverage without while still playing nice with the people that value our um, our reports and, and we don't want to make too many enemies. So it's a tricky balance to strike. Uh, we also have a bunch of these global initiatives that we've uh, either started or been pulled into. So Seafood Watch started with just consumers in mind. We want to give out pocket guides and information and build an app so that consumers know what to buy and what to avoid. And once the momentum built, businesses started to come to us directly to ask us like, well, can you, just, can you just look at what we're selling and tell us what we maybe want to stop selling and what else we could replace it with? And, and um, I'll get into the business program in a bit. And that, that developed into enough market significance for us with all of the business partners we had developed that governments were coming to us. And we would red rate um, like farmed salmon from Chile, which is about half of what US imports for, for salmon come from Chile. So the Chilean government was like, hey, we don't want to be red. That's bad for our business. What can we do? How can we work with you to figure out what's wrong and how we can make improvements? So we started realizing there's a real need for us to help um, support that, those improvement. We don't call them improvement projects specifically because a fishery improvement project is a distinct thing yeah. that is aiming at the MSC standard. They're trying to get MSC certification at the end of that improvement work. So these are like improvement projects, but they're based on our standard and aiming to achieve a yellow or green rating instead of a certification. Um, so we started getting governments interested in working with us and it seemed like too good of an opportunity to influence a huge amount of production. Like India shrimp is a, a massive uh, amount of shrimp that's globally significant and some of, some, most of the farm shrimp on the US market is from India. So it is very valuable for us to engage there and help them understand what our market expectations are or what our standard, why they were scored the way they were. We're trying to build initiatives that are context specific and led by local stakeholders. So we're not coming in to tell them how to improve. We're just flagging the, the problem areas and letting the room problem solve that. And let the government and industry folks from that country figure out the best way to, to solve those problems. Um, so this is just a, a few of them. We have India Shrimp, like I mentioned. VSSA is the Vietnam Sustainable Shrimp Alliance. It's focused on about nine, or what's the number? 20,000 farms in 
the southern like Mekong Delta on the bottom of, of Vietnam are working with us to try to improve. Um, it's really tricky because they're, they're very small, because sometimes single family owned farms that are trying to build a network that's sustainable. Um, so that's a, a lot of uh, evaluate, or monitoring that we have to do to make sure that all of the farms in a particular area are performing because they're not all owned by one company applying the same process to each farm. Um, we have a blue swimming crab improvement uh, project in the Philippines that is kicking off, but it's just in the planning stages. Um, there's also Southern Mekong Delta Monodon. Monodon is uh, black tiger prawn, the big, the big ones you see in the store, similar to the VSSA, but for a different product. Um, and, and, these, and it seems like we've got more and more interest building. So we'll probably step more into this in the coming years. This is something we haven't been doing much of in the last 23 years, but it's, we're now, we have a full global program and, and, and staff dedicated to just this work and not reports and basically taking our reports and, and build, building projects on top of them and helping uh, countries improve. Any questions on, on this piece? Make sure I'm All right, so all, uh, the other, we just talked about the science program and what they do. This is our program engagement team, which we completely dissolved during COVID, unfortunately. We, huh. we laid off about 40% of our staff and we just rehired the whole team in the last year. 40% of the aquarium staff or of Seafood uh, the, Watch? Of uh, the Conservation and Science Division. Okay. So Seafood Watch was about 40%. The okay. main aquarium, there's there was large layoffs. I don't know what the percentage was, but um, yeah, a lot of the you know the people that interact with guests, if we're right. closed, right. they don't, they don't right. the hourly staff were no longer needed, but there were animals to feed. Security had to, the power had to stay on, the pipes had to stay clean. So there were still staff, but it was a pretty hard hit. And then, you know, our income went to zero, right. basically. So. Right. Um, so we have a couple of arms of this program engagement strategy. One is outreach to the public. Our, our model is ask by choose. We want consumers to ask for sustainable products when they go to the store, to preferentially buy green and then yellow rated products when they can find them and then choose to support uh, Seafood Watch business partners and, and uh, restaurants. So we've got a whole bunch of ways we reach consumers. We've got obviously this massive aquarium that hosts more than 2 million visitors a year. Uh, we've got uh, 4 million website users or so uh, every year. We've distributed 60 million consumer guides since we uh, first started. And plus you know, social media, our social media presence is continuing to grow and we're focusing um, more and more on um, Twitter and Instagram and less on Facebook because we're seeing like declines in Facebook uh, trends and, and viewership. Um, and we're thinking about bringing back the app. The app was retired when we launched our new website because our website is now a very mobile friendly. Version. Oh, it's retired? Yeah. So it hasn't huh. been updated in a while. Oh, oh okay. Some people, they, it, it, it has a note when if you were to open it now, that's like this has been, this is no longer being supported, go to our website. You can download an icon that looks like an app, but it just opens our website ah. on your device and has all the up-to-date stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but we found that, that we may still be missing, like not all of that previous app users are visible as mobile users on our website now using the Google Analytics data. So we're thinking we might want to reintroduce the app because that seems really popular and we don't want to lose that 2 million uh, you know, app user audience. So. Oh, there's a lot of work. So that two million was per year, or that was like to since total. we started. Okay, that was total. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And only two, only two million. Only two oh, million. Oh man. Yeah, and we also have um, a whole network of what we call conservation partners, and those are about two hundred other zoos and aquaria, and nature centers, and things. There are other other nonprofits that will hand out our pocket guides for us, talk about Seafood Watch and our messaging and our, our asks. Um, they represent. Uh, an audience size of about 350 million visitors from you know, all across the world. We have conservation partners in many different countries, and that was a, a program that kind of got put to the side and is coming back online in, in earnest this year. We're higher, we actually currently have a position open to, to run this program hmm. because our, our previous staff member uh, was cut due to COVID, unfortunately. Um, but this is a really a fun. Uh, it, w it will be a fun position whoever gets it because you get to like travel to all these other cool places to, to support events at other zoos and stuff it's it, I think it's going to be um, nice to have that back online again and we also have a chef program where we I think previously had something like 50 or 60 chefs that were in our network and they would uh, not only advocate in their social media platforms and in the media for for sustainable fishing and aquaculture practices 
Uh, but they, if they owned restaurants, many of them would commit to sourcing only sustainable seafood for their businesses. Um, and a lot of them would do visits to DC with us to advocate for sustainable fishing policies, um, you know, at the federal level. And they're, they're very influential. So if, if, you know, it's in some cases better for a chef that you love and, and respect to say something about sustainable seafood being meaningful than a nonprofit whose sole purpose is to advertise that. They, they have a lot of sway uh, culinarily. So um, this is another program that is coming back online. Yeah. So say for example, one of the chefs didn't want to do this anymore. Like they decide not to share any content on social media. They decide to leave the program. What, what happens like with that information that they have and stuff like that? Like what, what happens basically? Uh, they, they can just, they're, they're opting in. They're volunteering. We're not, um, besides like hosting events where they can, they can come and learn more about the latest and greatest that's happening at Seafood Watch. Same thing with our business partners. It's totally volunteer. If they don't want to. Oh, so it's not like they're contracted or anything no, like that? No. Oh, okay. So I have a question. So, um, you know, I uh, see a lot of the um, um, Seafood Watch uh, restaurants and, and, and chefs, but geographically they seem really uh, Monterey kind of yeah. coastal California focused. Yeah. Is, yeah. I'm just curious as to what the overall distribution is. Is that yeah, correct? I could, or? I could pull something up after this and show you. I actually have a map. Okay. In, in Tableau that displays all of our business partners okay. and stuff that um, we're mostly working closely with a select few, and I'll talk about this in the business partner piece, um, kind of strategic major buyer partners that okay. that are like um, Whole Foods or Aramark, which is like a, a, a distributor that, that supplies like campuses and stadiums right. and stuff. Right. And, um, and uh, Cisco's like, of the world yeah, and stuff. Yeah, like major, major companies that have a lot of seafood purchasing power and can throw their weight around. Like they can they can go into a country or one of those engagement products they're working with and help support that. And they're enough of a carrot to get mm -hmm. the government to be interested because they're they they're you know they could buy the majority of the products from that product from that project mm -hmm. given certain you know caveats. You mm -hmm. know? Um, so yeah, the businesses are one thing we've talked about is uh, it's a lot easier to just go to a retailer that you know has already done all the research in the back end to provide you with products you can trust and they're environmentally responsible without having to pull out the website and search for tuna and scroll, scroll, scroll. scroll. Um, so like for me, if I'm, if I'm gonna have a seafood dinner, I'll often just go to Whole Foods and buy it because I know that they're already doing the work to have all the sustainable stuff in their, in their fresh case. I don't have to, so say, okay, it's a product of China, but where was it caught? Yeah, <laughs> where was totally, it? It's, totally. it's really, it can be tricky because the, the, that's one of the biggest issues is the data on seafood origins is lacking and the supply chain is super complicated. So by the time it gets into a package in your freezer at Safeway, you don't, it may just say product of Thailand, but it doesn't tell you how it was caught. Um, and, and in some cases it could be packaged there, but not caught there. So it's, it's tricky to figure out what you're looking at. Um, and on that, we're actually going to talk about uh, our business engagement. So we have currently two staff members that deal with all of our business partnerships, which is a lot of work. And we're trying to get um, these, these big buyers to make um, public facing time bound commitments to um, source sustainable seafood, to support our engagement work in countries, to support legislation and, and sign on to letters that advocate for stronger management and enforcement. Um, they, um, they also will have uh, you know, education campaigns and we will supply them with materials to educate their employees and the customers that come through about sustainable seafood and why it matters. So they're another hub to get our information out there and their purchasing power can be used to influence production in certain projects. Um, and we also annually pull all of their sourcing information, like big spreadsheets of every product they buy, and we map our ratings to each individual mm -hmm. row and we tell them, here's how much of your sourcing is currently read. Here's alternative products you should consider here. Go ask these suppliers these questions so we can fill in some of the data gaps and then we can tell you, okay, you should be looking for shrimp from Ecuador instead of from here because there's more yellow production that would meet your commitment. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it, this is one where they do have a formal like working agreement with us and they've committed to do certain things on a certain timeline and we're keeping track on their progress and stuff. So a much heavier lift than some of the smaller retail partners that we have that just sign on to basically a newsletter and they get information from us, but it's up to them to deploy those suggestions. We don't keep track of it all. It's too many. I think there's 650 like subscriber business partners that we, we don't really monitor. Wow. Okay, cool. Um, 
and that's I'll, I'm about to jump into kind of my role. Do you guys have any questions about kind of the model that Seafood Watch has, has built over the years or any of our strategies? So I'm, I'm curious as to how, so we'll talk about this when we talk about it, but, um, but so there's, there's certifications, right? And there's green buying guides. Mm -hmm. And this is, we're talking here more of a green, green buying guide. Well, how do you guys describe that? Because green buying guide is what people used to use, but it seems like other people are using different terms. So how do you guys describe your like sort of generic approach to Yeah, we define like we have certifications and ratings. Mm -hmm. and, and certifications are a, you know, a pay to play model. The fishery has to pay to get evaluated and certified, and then they can put that label on their products. Um, it's, uh, we've seen, you know, some, I, I think we've kind of, we try to play nicely, but I think that most people in the rating space think that's a more effective strategy because it's not voluntary. We're gonna evaluate you whether you want it or not. And we're gonna, and more importantly, we're gonna focus a lot of our attention on the stuff that's underperforming to help them understand where they're not, um, you know, meeting our standards and then hopefully kind of improve the, that production practice in some way where certification is, is highlighting the high performers and and we are we are doing that and to some degree that's what the green is doing mm -hmm. and um, also flagging where there are problem areas that we might want to engage so our information we hope is going to be used to um, for you know individual fisheries or governments to just take the report and figure out what they need to do and make some adjustments or to come work with us to, to build a improvement project so yeah ratings are, are quite distinct and and some of the improvement projects are focused on those like very small single uh, owner farms where there's just like one or two ponds per family. And that certification doesn't really work well in that kind of setup because none of those farms have enough money to pay for a certification. So even if they're high performing, no one would ever know it. Mm -hmm. But we have a thing called the in, uh, independent, ver or sorry, improvement verification platform, which is just a tablet based app where mm -hmm. they can kind of self evaluate their mm -hmm. farm and get, um, uh, a res, you know, like a result that shows if they're a, a, a performing at a certain level based on our standard. Cool. And then uh, if they're, uh, once we have a project that's supporting that IVP, we've got a bunch of staff dedicated to it and we've got an independent auditor that will come in and verify the, the review they've done. They've done self-assessment and then we'll have like one of our local or regional staff members come through and do another evaluation. If they pass both of those and the formal audit people come through, mm -hmm do another evaluation and then they're kind of flagged as a green or green equivalent operation. And we're not sure how to talk about that stuff yet because it's not as rigorous as a full blown assessment. And it's very specific to that farm and trying to knit those farms together. Cause you could have one very sustainable operation in a sea of right. unsustainable farms. And it just, it, it, it's kind of an irrelevant, it's irrelevant to some degree. It's good for that farmer. We want more of that, but, but they all share channels right. and, and the system is still unsustainable in that region. So we have to figure out how to, um, to communicate that once mm -hmm. we have like a, like a whole you know, section of Vietnam that is certified as green performing, do we call that a green rating or is that is the teal rating or something? It's not, we're still, yeah, we're still figuring out the comms and how we're going to actually bring those into our, like our website and stuff. But we have projects that are tailored to small scale producers where certification is usually only useful to big operations with lots of money that can pay for mm -hmm. the certification. Right. Right. Um, so, uh, before I get into that, what I do, uh, is support, uh, uh, amongst other things, the monitoring and evaluation of seafood watch. And that's, where we are, or some people call it monitoring, evaluation, and learning, where we're trying to track all the work that we're doing and figure out how effective it is or not and make adjustments. Um, so it's something that a lot of funders and a lot of nonprofits, have, it's kind of in vogue right now because they're giving us millions of dollars a year to do certain work and they want to make sure that it's doing the job that it's expected to and it's on a, a certain timeline and that um, the outcomes are realized. So we're starting to get better and better at tracking these sorts of things. And it all started with this. You don't have to read any of the details. This is just a conceptual model. Um, it's a very complex network of all of the influencing factors that we could brainstorm on sticky notes on a wall over the course of a couple of months. If ultimately our goal here is to improve the sustainability of global fisheries and aquaculture and marine and freshwater systems for both habitat and species, um, what what are the upstream effects that would, would lead to more or less sustainable production. So we just mapped this out as best we could and did arrows and double-headed arrows and um, everything from 
it's difficult to implement, or there's greenwashing, there's general public engagement and knowledge, business practices, the economics of seafood fishing in general, like uh, uh, just waste, overconsumption, a, a market for cheap seafood, everything we could think of. And then we try to build it all together to figure out where do we actually fit into this network? Of it, where, where's our influence focused? And there's engagement, science here, the business program there, and, and just trying to kind of get a sense of the whole landscape of, of sustainable seafood and, uh, and where our strategies slot in. And from that, we build a theory of change in a program called Marathi, which is just uh, basically a series of if-then statements where we, we are laying out our assumptions. If we um, engage with, say, like key audiences, our, the key audiences are reached with an appropriate message. What happens if people listen to us and then and, and take it take us seriously? Well, and may, maybe sustainable seafood issue salience is ma maintained within the U.S. public. Um, and if that happens, uh, you know maybe major buyers implement some commitments because they're feeling that market pressure from consumers. So we just did the same thing, but now we're talking about like if we do this, what do we expect to happen? And if that happens, what do we expect to happen? Um, so. We can, um, we can build uh, this model to help us understand what our actual objectives are in each of these areas. And ultimately we identify very important assumptions that we have to make sure are valid or the whole thing falls apart. Like if our red rating in this next one, like we did the same thing for, we, we do an assessment, the rating is red. What happens, to, what do we think might happen if a rating is red? Um, we think they might get a lower price than a green or yellow product. They might have restricted access to markets. They might feel some campaign or NGO pressure, loss of access to investment funding, or, or it's just a blemish on their record. They don't like the, the, the negative view that their fishery might have and, and, um, and then they just wanna make adjustments. And so we're trying to make sure that what we expect to happen is actually happening and, and testing, like release. Hmm. If a fishery has been downgraded, watch the effect and try to track that there's actually improvements being made. Because if we're releasing all this information and nobody's really making adjustments, um, we need to rethink the approach because it's not working. But we, we do have examples of people you know, reaching out to us and telling us about specific changes they made because of the red rating or the effect of it on um, you know, fishers in their area. So we're still, we're, we're still in the midst of, of working through some of these questions and figuring out how to analyze like trade data to show if we red rate this product does more of it get exported because the U.S. market is softened for like American lobster. Say we're thinking about how, how would we track that downgrade was very significant. Um, can can we evaluate its effect on the global market for for lobster? And we have another one of these for uh, outreach to the general public. What do we expect to happen if we reach consumers and they believe that sustainable seafood is is worth buying and they're using their money accordingly? Um, and then we just uh, figure out which of those assumptions is the most important one and start to try to figure out how to analyze if that's actually happening. Um, and let's see. The, basically, this is this, all of that, that extensive network, that theory of change, that conceptual model that I showed was way too complicated for most of the aquarium leadership it was, <laughs> as it was for us it's too hard to talk through it's 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 pretty much irrelevant it's so detailed and it's overwhelming um so this is what we created to actually put into powerpoints and stuff it lays out the very simplified model um that we're using our our you know assessments and the ratings that, they, that are contained within them uh, will inform consumers about what's sustainable and what's not, and hopefully they will take that advice and, and use their purchasing power to influence what businesses are able to sell. And then the business will feel that market pressure and, and decide they're gonna just sell sustainable seafood or more sustainable seafood than they have in the past. And that just increases demand in the US market for those sustainable products. That pressure is felt by producers because the, the US market is a kind of a price premium market. We, we have, um, uh, a preference for high, very high quality, very fresh seafood. So um, producers want to sell here. So if our businesses are strong enough in their commitment, producers will ultimately improve their practices uh, to be able to sell to the U.S. market. And then, and these two can be flip flopped. It kind of depends on the situation. But the ultimate goal is to have whatever improvements are made 
in the fisheries or farms be hard coded into regulations at the, at the country or regional level. Um, then that can either force the producers to make the change or in some cases the producer, the producers have already made the move and the government is recognizing that's now the, the, the norm in the industry and that's going to be the requirement for new operation. Um, so that's, that's the whole theory of change uh, in kind of an infographic. Mm -hmm. Cool. And uh, yeah, so the, the, the result of all that work was these are screen grabs of the Tableau, the Tableau dashboards that I build. It's a way to take the data that I've got and turn it into actual like useful charts for our leadership to understand trends in our social media platforms, our published and retired assessments every quarter or every year. And this is um, an older version of a global like environmental sustainability dashboard that takes the, the global production data set for seafood that the FAO releases every March. They update it every March. And we have mostly manually assigned ratings to every relevant row in the production data, which with multiple years is multiple millions of rows. It's a, it's a lot of work to maintain. Um, but that is how we get to, you know, 40% ratings coverage in this screen grab and ultimately about 50% when the in progress stuff um, is released. And the nice thing about it is the, the, dash, the dashboard displays the whole data set in a really simplified way. So you can click on the wild production only. It'll filter all the other charts down to just the wild production. You can click on China. It'll filter the species chart down to just what China's producing and how much of it's red or yellow. Um, so if you're only interested in like what, who's the, what country produces the most avoid rated products, you could, you could filter the whole dashboard down to that and just see where those problem areas are. What, where are the biggest knowledge gaps? Where, where, where do we have a lot of unrated coverage right now for certain species of high interest to the U.S. market and start figuring out where that next assessment needs to be. So that's most of my work. It's built 80% uh, working with the data that is displayed here and then ultimately sharing it with our leadership teams. And that's it. Cool. Do you guys have questions? Yeah. Uh, could you go back to the last question? Sure. So the social media, what's that data point you're looking for? Like, who are these different types of apps? Like, pictures, hashtags, or people comments? Like, yeah. Um, actually, let me let me pull up um, this real quick. I'll pull up the, the dashboard itself um, and show you guys the, the real version. So this one is still the, Q, the Q3. Uh, this is actually not fully updated yet because we decided not to present these data to the leadership. And instead, we're gonna revise it somewhat dramatically and present it in the new year. Um, but yeah, we're pulling a lot of data for social media from a platform called Sprout Social that harvests all of it for us from the various platforms. Um, we care about audience size, engagement rate, like how often we're getting likes, comments, shares, um, and actually, here's the, remind me tomorrow. This is the, the subscriber. Uh, let me go to <laughs> Max is getting into it, yeah. <laughs> this is the nerdy stuff. So this is like our, our, um, subs our business subscribers that you would talk mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. This is the breakdown of all of the subscribers and where they're located. So there's 696 currently subscribed all around the world. And most of them are restaurants, some mm -hmm. reporters, 64 individuals and stuff like that. So we can start to see kind of the scope of our influence. Um, but. And so that volume of 180 million pounds, that's per year? Yeah, or is that, okay. that, that's, yeah, they self report, annualized. Uh, okay. are, they're, they're within a particular range. Okay. And then I just assume they're at the very low end of their range. So I'm not overestimating gotcha. <laughs> their, gotcha. their, gotcha. their sourcing. So we're, we don't know, like this is nice. It's a, it's a cool map to show um, how many partners we have. But at the moment, they're, we're not really actively engaging with this audience much besides sharing the tools and information in the newsletter. Mm. Um, but we, it's, there's too many uh, restaurants to monitor and have them like send us their sourcing data and stuff like that. We're expecting them. They've kind of self committed to doing um, the right thing and source sustainably and talk about sustainable seafood. So uh, we are assuming that that's happening. But obviously, there's also 64 individuals. It might be like the restaurant chef, but not the whole restaurant has mm. subscribed. But there, there's employees there that are interested in the information. And so, I mean, obviously, this is a huge amount of work. So I, I don't mean to 
I hope this doesn't sound like a criticism, but you guys are focused on North America, right? And yeah. then and then it's that these other folks in Australia or whatever have reached out, but you guys aren't actively trying to grow your subscriber program outside of the US or am I miss speaking? No, there? no, we're not as far as I know, we're not like recruiting for right. new subscribers. And we're just kind of like if you want our information, cool. you've heard of us before. We're just not you know, we're not that prompt. No one in Africa right cares that much about sustainable right. seafood right. As, like the u.s market it's mostly right. like europe and north america that ha is affluent enough for that to be a, re a legitimate concern like how environmentally that's just a, a rich person problem basically a rich country problem um, but we do have um you know a, a smattering of other <laughs> locations that we've been working where people um seem to know about us and care what we what we have to say but we're not even with our major buyer partners we're not as far as i know recruiting or like chasing down certain retailers or restaurant chains sure. because a lot of them already have partnerships with, if not us, other mm -hmm. folks that are doing similar work and helping them understand the sustainability of their mm -hmm. sourcing. So I think it's something I've thought about a lot is how strict we want to be with our business partners and the expectations that they're going to do like make dramatic changes to their sourcing, engage in our improvement work, or we can't we have two staff. We need we need people who are really on board and do and helping us out to achieve the, our goals. Otherwise, like we can't we can't keep maintaining this relationship because we got a lot of people in the queue right. that are that are ready to partner with us that might be more actively involved in this work. So, um, but that's the business team makes those calls as to like who's who's worth our time and um, who's you know n not making uh, meaningful progress on their time bound commitment, and then we have to decide okay what do we do like. We, we want to play nice, but we need them to, you know, uh, meet the goals they've set out for themselves. Um, cool. And this is, so I pick the right page. There's a lot of slides. Um, so this one, yeah, no. Here's the updated version of social media. Hmm. Mm -hmm slide um and it, it has right now this is going to get replaced by linkedin soon but we track followers impressions just eyeballs on our posts over time um, number of engagements uh how many people clicked or shared or commented or, or liked um, and then the number of posts over time and you can see covid mm -hmm. on all the charts we you know we lost our mm -hmm. staff member in like maybe june or something so that's right there posts go down to you know a couple uh, a month and and our engagement and impressions just drop off a cliff for the same reason mm -hmm. but all of these charts um all of these uh things are are interactive so you can you can see you can increase the resolution of what you can see um for each of these cool um, and, the, and, and you guys are just sucking in so they're aggregating the data for you you're just sort of um organizing it and and visualizing it yeah exactly yeah. we have a platform that that does this for us and i just take i take it out and um turn it into a, a consistent dashboard sure. so that our leadership team is, is like a one-stop shop for all the data that we think is relevant right now and that's always a moving target i work with the teams to go are you guys actually using this stuff right. or is this just a nice to know right because i don't right. want to spend the time harvesting all these data putting them into a dashboard if everyone's like oh neat. that's nice and anyway don't look at it right. three more months right 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 this is the most significant one a version of this is on our website this is the most amount of work even though it's one of the simplest um and this is where you can see all of seafood production um this is 20 this is 2020 data um or no i think this is still 2019 potentially but um what you can do is like if you just want to see um all of the red rated products um this will filter down to 18 million metric tons of red rated production the vast majority of that's coming from china most of that is white lake shrimp if you click on china you'll see this adjust to just china's red production mm. um, and you can do that for if you just want to see msc certifications in this dashboard asc certifications mm, cool best aquaculture practices the stuff that's in progress that i mentioned the the, the china carp and the peruvian and chilean and chavetta um, and in here which is not a public facing product yet we had one of our researchers suggests a project where we take our ratings database that has species, country, gear type variables in it and build a model around that that can basically project ratings into the unrated production based on similar species, similar gear types, 
coming from a similar country, we would expect it to rate in a similar mm. way. They're not as reliable as a rating, obviously. There's no assessment behind it. But we do have, and you can see almost none of the, the um, predictions are green. They're almost always yellow or red. Um, mm. And it's only for wild at the moment. But we're trying to think how, how if we decide to share this stuff externally, what would we, that's why it says P green, predicted green, predicted yellow, predicted red. Um, but um, that's a very uncomfortable thing sure, for us. For, totally. For credibility and, and totally. Do we, we don't want people to not buy those things because they're not really red, but we think they might be red if we were to do an evaluation. So uh, we're still, we're likely going to change these if we ever shared. It wouldn't be green, yellow, red. It mm -hmm. would be shades of gray or something. Mm -hmm. So that it doesn't look like a rating. Um, but we're trying to figure out like, there's a big information gap. There's 50% of the world that has effectively no information on the environmental performance of that production. And some information is better than nothing. So what can we do to fill in that gap? Because about 10% of total production, as you can see, is um, this marine fish's NEI and freshwater fish's NEI. You know, some total of what, 9.3% of global production is species non-specific. It's bad data. It's not reported at the species level. We don't know what it is and we can't apply a rating. It's not certified. We, there's just a black hole. So, you know, 10% of production or so. We have Red no, snapper. We have no idea what it is. <laughs> and so we'll never be able to get 100% rating coverage because there's just, we don't know what that 10% is. Um, but we do need to know, like, for prioritization purposes, maybe we look at this 12.6% and go, okay, we think it's probably red. Let's look at what we're thinking is probably red and say, okay, should we do a full assessment? Is it is it a high value product? Are any of these... And you can see this is broken up by yeah, that's cool. That's country. Cool. So okay, there's yeah, there's Morocco's producing a lot of European pilchard. Is that a product that our business partners care about? Because right. that would that's a lot of production that we right. evaluate. Um, and you can just use this to to even if we don't share it publicly, it might help us fit or uh, plan our our next round of reports mm -hmm. a little better. So we're still trying to figure out that. So the version on our website. Um, doesn't have the, the what if or possible projected yeah there's no there's no predicted right. um, stuff on there that's great that's cool